everybody. Welcome to the Sportlight Podcast. This week, we had the incredible opportunity to sit down with one of the greatest college quarterbacks of all time, 1990 Heisman Trophy winner, Ty Detmer. He talked about some of the dynamics that have been created now in college sports, now that players could be paid for their image and likeness and how that might trickle down even into high school sports. He talked about some of the great coaches that he played for and what he learned from them about athletics and about life including his own father. And he gave some wonderful advice to those of you parents who coach your own children on how to help your child get the most out of themselves athletically while maintaining the incredible relationship with them like the one that Ty had with his own father. It's a great, great listen. We hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Sportlight Podcast for parents, coaches, and athletes. The Sportlight refers to the time in an athlete's life when they have increased ability to affect the culture around them and the increased opportunity to learn life's lessons through sports. This podcast aims to help parents and coaches capitalize on their athletes' precious time in the Sportlight. The Sportlight Podcast is brought to you by Especially for Athletes program. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Sportlight Podcast. I'm Dustin Smith. I'm here with Shad Martin, and we are super excited for today's guest. We've got, I call him the GOAT. I've known him for a lot of years, and and in the uh, the quarterback world, which Ty Detmer and I have been partners in, in a, another business called Quarterback Elite. I, I don't think they get any better over the last, you know, 40 years than, than Ty Detmer. So we have former Heisman Trophy winner and, and longtime NFL vet and coach and close friend of especially for athletes, Ty Detmer on with us today. So Ty, thank you for joining us. Yeah, you bet. I'm happy to be on with you. Ty's uh, residing down in Arizona now and, and Ty, fill us in a little bit on, on what you've been up to and for some of the, the Ty Detmer fans that might be listening, fill us in on your life. How, you, how are you and what's going on? Well, doing great. Got uh, two grandkids, a two-year-old boy and a six-month-old little girl. So they're, uh, you know, they're taking up a lot of time when when we get a chance. But been working with uh, American Leadership Academies down here in Arizona. Uh, we've got three high schools here in the valley down here, Phoenix area, and uh, now they've talked me into being the head coach at ALA Queen Creek. So. I get to coach with Max Hall and Dennis Pitta, a couple of BYU guys, and uh, looking forward to that for this year. And we're just kind of back in the coaching side of things and, and trying to develop young men. And and uh, that's something I really enjoy and, and excited to be a part of again. And and then, uh, like I said, the, the grandkids are keeping us busy outside of that. So we'll try to Texas and get to Texas every day as well. At the time will be limited a little more with coaching this year. Tell everybody uh, what's going on in your ranch out in uh, Texas. <laughs> well, we've had a lot of rain this year, so things are good. Uh, uh, just same old stuff. Just have a few hunters every year come down and enjoy time outdoors and, and uh, you know, still enjoying that part of it. As well. If any hunters listening want to find out more about that, where can they go to find out about your hunts? It's a uh, website's t- Fourteen uh, ranch.net so t14 they can email me through there or, or just kind of check things out on the site and uh, like i said this year might be a little more limited with the coaching side of things we should have a pretty good team so i'll go into december but uh yeah. we'll see see what happens there awesome well let's dive into some questions shad you want to start off with and we'll get going on uh Asking Ty some questions. Yeah. So, Ty, one of the things that I would love, anytime we have someone on who's played for Lavelle Edwards and some of those great coaches of BYU and and have learned some things from from them, I would just love to to get your perspective on that wonderful coach. And uh, now, as you're a coach, what do you what do you take with you from from those great coaches you had at BYU? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think lessons are learned early on in life. That's one of the reasons I I enjoy coaching high school football. You'll see a 14-year-old knucklehead come in the program and hopefully they leave as 18-year-old young men ready to tackle the world a little bit. Uh, 
know that Dustin's doing that with his team there in Spanish Fork. And um, so I, you know, I learned early on from my dad was a high school football coach for over 50 years, really ingrained a lot of uh, a lot of the values that I, I still have today. Um, those were ingrained early on and then had the opportunity, to, like you said, to go play for Lavelle and a real similar type of person, you know, kind of taught you the, the game, taught you. Uh, reinforce life lessons, uh, those kind of things. So, um, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to have great coaches from an early age and that carried on through college. And then, uh, you know, guys like Mike Homer and Steve Mariucci, uh, those kind of guys at the NFL level, um, you know, NFL is a little different because it's really, it's more of a business and you're, you're worried about winning games. Um, but, you know, a guy like Steve Mariucci kind of helped keep things in perspective for guys and, and uh, you know, wasn't just concerned with the on-the-field product, was, you know, worried about your family and how you were doing outside of football. And and that's the way Lavelle was, too, you know, how, how are you doing outside of, of the game? And so, you know, fortunate to have those type of people in my life uh, as mentors and, and now having the opportunity to coach. I'm I'm hoping I have that same influence that like my dad did on me, that I'm having that influence on young men right now here in Arizona. Well, Ty, I, uh, I've been down to, to see your, your facilities and your team. And I know the influence that you and Max have on those boys. Um, I want to jump right into a subject that is really relevant right now and, and, you know, fairly fresh in the news. And I think you are a, you know, perfect person to, to get some thoughts on this. So on July 1st, the NCAA, uh, it's now official and legal for college athletes to accept money and and sponsorship deals and things like that. That I'm sure would have been a pretty nice gig for you back in the late eighties when you were on cover of sports illustrated. What are your thoughts on that? You know, pluses, minuses, good and bad. What do you think about that situation? I prefer saying early nineties, first of all, (laughs) (laughs) Um, but yeah, it's an interesting time. I mean, you're seeing things on Twitter or in the news where, you know, there's a handful of guys coming out saying whatever I make, I'm going to share with my teammates. And uh, then, you know, there's other guys that have set up their own brand and they're on, on a website and they're, they're, getting everything they can, you know, right now. And, and it's going to be a tricky situation for coaches. I mean, that, that kind of stuff can really divide a team can, you know, cause guys to all of a sudden they're in the transfer portal. Um, Shad and I were kind of talking a little before, like, you know, a, a backup at BYU could probably go and make a, you know, a pretty good chunk of money at a Dixie state or a Weber or Southern or, or somewhere else that, you know, there's some, some boosters and some donors there that would, would love to, you know, help the team, uh, you know, upgrade a little bit. And so it's going to be an interesting uh, time over the course of the next year. And, and the teams that, you know, are solid with, with solid values and solid character, I think will continue to, to rise to the top. Um, the teams where it's every man for himself and, and everybody's trying to get theirs. Uh, are, are going to struggle just with that team chemistry and camaraderie and, and guys being happy and, and guys mad that they're not getting touches. It's hurting their hitting and, and all those things. So it's a, it's a different world and, and it's really going to be some challenges for coaches and, and teammates uh, to help them to, you know, keep that team chemistry that, that really makes you a good football team. Well, I can imagine when you were, uh, you know, during, during your Heisman run and the the Miami game and the, the Sports Illustrated cover and all of the things that you had, that was back before social media and obviously before you could accept, you know, money for those those sort of things. And your life had to have been just crazy and hectic without all of this stuff. What what would have, how, how, do you think you could have? I mean, it's obviously hard to look back and and now, but knowing how much of a spotlight you had on yourself back then, can you imagine, could you have handled it? You think with all the social media and all the pressures and stuff now that kids have? Yeah, it's definitely tough. Uh, You got to have the right people around you. And and like I said, the right, you know, characters and values at at the school you're at. I think a school like BYU and a guy like LaBelle 
would help you to handle some of those things. Um, but it, it's definitely a different world. I mean, there's, there's guys already out there. Like, like I said, they're, they got their own website up and running and, and it's, you know, get what I can right now. And so do you focus on the marketing side, focus on the football and, and winning game side, and then the rest takes care of itself later. Or, or are you trying to get it now in college? Cause you're not sure if you're going to get it later uh, when you're done. So there's, there's, 10 times the distraction I ever had now, especially with the, the sponsorship and marketing side of things. I mean, these guys are going to have marketing teams now that are running that forum and, and you, you know, your parents are having to deal with that and who's running the, the foundation or the website, who's, who's pushing it. And, and now the kids just sitting there like at the mercy of the people around him sometimes too. So it's going to create a ton of friction within the family. Even I would guess uh, at yeah. times, if you're not careful and and you really have the values that are important, um, and so I'm, I'm kind of anxious to see where it goes and and what the can of worms looks like uh, a year from now. I'm nervous about it, to be honest <laughs> with you, Shad. I think it, I think they have opened up a can of worms that I think is. Uh, I don't, I don't think they're going to, I think it's going to be a nightmare personally. I mean, so all these five-star recruits there, they can, they not do it in high school now. I mean, you're going to have high school already had some out the spring season in California because they didn't want to ruin their recruiting or, or get hurt. You got guys out bowl games now um, because they're trying to get ready for the NFL. You're going to have, I mean, there's, of them have sat out the whole season last year and paid because they felt like they were NFL guys. And yeah. so, I mean, it's our, we're already into that mentality and now you throw this on top of it. Uh, where, where does it go from here? And, and at what age does it start? And now, you know, I mean, there's all these, you know, club teams and basketball and these kids are going to be able to market themselves as middle schoolers. Uh, some of them, you know, that you're like, this guy's an up and comer and, and people can see what the future holds, especially in basketball. And it's yeah. at what, what age does it start and, and where does it go from there? You know, it's, it can yeah. create a real problem. If you have certain measurables, you're a, a big, tall athletic basketball player and you're 14 and you've got a good shot and it's obvious that you're a player. I mean, you're six ten or whatever, there's a real legitimate argument to why play high school football or basketball or football. Like why even do it? Why risk getting hurt? You're obviously, you have the height and the, the measurables and the skill set to be able to play. And if you got that attention coming in and you know, you're going to make some money someday. Uh, wow. I, I don't know. I, I hope I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm nervous about it. Well, and yeah. one thing I've been thinking and Ty, we talked about this a little bit before, but these principles of character, you yeah. know, for coaches and parents and people who surround these kids to teach them character because it, it, there's obviously going to be increased influence and increased power with these things. What we call the sport light is going to be brighter at an earlier age. But we've talked in previous podcasts how that sport light could destroy people. It can destroy their life but it can also expand their ability to do good. And so these very principles that we talk about, if young people with this increased spotlight, you know, to try to go positive, even though this could go very negative, if, if kids can learn these principles of, of incredible character and realize that this influence, this increased influence could be used for good, you know, hopefully that, that switch could be flipped in their brains and they can use that increased opportunity to do good and, and to help others. And uh, that's, that would be my hope, but there's going to be some rough lessons along the way. I'm sure. I think that's why it's so important what you have going with, especially for athletes, you know, that you're out there trying to get ahead of it, you know, with a lot of these kids and teach them the values and, and, how to handle that sport light, you know, when it comes. And so that's why, you know, I'm a big supporter of what you guys are doing and, and appreciate that because at some point, you know, it's, it's going to be there for, for all the athletes and in one form or another. Did you see guys, Ty, when you, uh, when you went to the NFL, 
obviously you are a big name coming out of college, but um, kind of put you on the spot here, but you don't have to name any names. But my guess is, is that you probably saw some kids come out of college into the NFL that that, that spotlight uh, probably gobbled them up. They weren't ready for it. They weren't mature enough for the money or for the attention. And um, nowadays, as we've just re- you know just discussed, that that happens a lot earlier. You can be a teenage kid and get the kind of attention that an NFLer got 30 years ago because of social media. The whole country knows who you are, which wasn't the case back in the you know 80s and 90s. So you know, do, do you have some examples or some warnings to some kids? If you, you saw some stuff, I'm guessing in the NFL. Oh yeah. You know, every year, I mean, the older I got, the the more you kind of paid attention to the rookies coming in and, and there were some of them that just, they didn't know how to handle the fame and the success and, and the money at that time. There were people throwing stuff at them They're you know, you're hearing them talking the, in the locker room, those kind of things. But um, yeah, I, I mean, every year you saw that happen with a, a guy here or there. And, and next thing you know, they're not in the next year. And, uh, you know, like you said, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna be at an earlier age for a lot of guys where, you know, people are gonna be throwing, throwing all kinds of stuff at them and and enticing them to be a part of something maybe they're not ready for. It's gonna be an interesting time for a lot of younger kids that, that have to get into it soon. So, you know, the more we can spread that message and and help be a part of the, the change, uh, I think I'm all in for that. Do you have any teammates you played with, Ty, that uh, – and I, my, my guess is you would be one that others would say fit this mold, but um, whether it was in college or NFL, do you have any teammates that jump out at you that were the type of guy that lived the our motto of eyes up, do the work, that used their sport light in a way that that gave back and helped others? And, and how do you feel like as a – parent of, a, of athletes yourself, a daughter who played collegiate soccer and is a coach. Any advice to parents listening to this on how we teach kids to live with their eyes up, do the work a little more? Yeah, kind of, you know, one of the things that really goes untalked about in the NFL is about every Tuesday is your day off and they have, uh, they have, uh, you know, a directors, a, a whole section of a team of people that set up uh, elementary school visits, charitable, you know, contributions, um, guys going to different, uh, schools or functions every Tuesday. Uh, there's, you know, eight or 10 NFL players every week, every Tuesday in every city that are going and doing great things. And, and sometimes more, you know, you may have 15 or 20 at times that are doing a school visit and, and uh, nobody really hears about that. You know, a lot of times all you hear about are the, the bad things a guy gets in trouble for the one guy on that one team out of 32, you don't hear about the 20 that are going every Tuesday doing something good in that community. And uh, most guys have, foundations where they're getting underprivileged kids to games or whatever it may be. Um, there's a lot of good that goes on. A lot of guys are, are using that sport light all across the country uh, every week during the season and, and a lot of them all, all throughout the year. So I definitely, you know, saw guys doing that every, every week on teams I played with and, and, uh, for parents, you know, I mean, that's, that's one thing we talk with our daughters about is trying to find a service opportunities where you're out there and, and not just staying in your own little bubble, but putting yourself out there a little bit. And so I think, you know, kids need those opportunities to, to serve, whether it's at a soup kitchen or whatever it may be an old folks home, uh, wherever they may be serving, there's opportunities out there. And, and it's important, I think, for, for our youth to learn that there's a lot of things and a lot of people that need, uh, that have needs out there that we could be helping with and, and doing on a weekly basis or monthly basis and just putting ourselves out there. You know, I, I think too these high school athletes and you've been around them the majority of your coaching career too. Um, but one thing that I've realized is I've watched my own daughters participate in athletics and watch dozens and dozens of high school football games and basketball games is there's always those little kids in the crowd 
that those kids playing are their heroes. Yeah. Not, not just the NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, you know, Olympic soccer, but I, I watched a little girl dressed in all, I mean, the cheerleading gear, and she was sitting there in the stands replicating the cheers of all the cheerleaders at a high school football game. And I think it's always so awesome when, when that switch flips in a teenager's brain that, hey, there's people I could do stuff for. And they start looking, especially for those opportunities, I mean, throughout their community, but also just those little opportunities that seem to present themselves at each game to play catch with a kid or to to recognize, a, take a picture with a little girl who dreams of being a cheerleader. And okay. those opportunities present themselves. And if if people have their, their eyes up looking for them, it doesn't have, you don't have to make it to the NFL before you begin to take those opportunities. So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, they're just even a simple five or like you said, you know, a cheerleader waving or smiling at the little girl in the stands and just recognizing people, you know, I mean, that's the motto eyes up, do the work, right. I mean, having your eyes up looking for opportunities to, to just make someone's day, especially that those younger kids that are there and, and, uh, being a positive role model for them and, and keeping that dream of, you know, keeping the dream alive. I, I know for me, when I was a kid, I was a big Spurs fan and I saw uh, Larry Keenan was a, a Spurs player uh, in the grocery store one day. And I went up to him and asked for his autograph. He signed the paper and talked a little bit. And, and that left a lasting impression for me that, you know, Hey, if, had he said, Hey, get away, you know, ah. Eh, and get out of here. I'm not signing anything. I'm on my free time. Maybe it's a whole different, you know, perspective that I have. And, and maybe the, the team loses a fan at that point too, you know? And so, um, you know, that was a positive, uh, impact on my life. And so I've always remembered that, um, from that time. And, and I've always tried to, to emulate that. And, and, you know, if people ask, I've, I'm never said no to an autograph, you know, so probably, from that interaction I had as a kid. Hmm. Interesting. Cool. Ty, what, one of the principles, as you know, of, especially for athletes, um, is resiliency. And you and I have talked about this as we've done quarterback camps and things. We've, we've kind of beat this topic, uh, to death with quarterbacks about the importance of being gritty and, and resilient. Um, you are one of the most resilient, uh, college football players that that I remember watching you you came into BYU at 100 and what 70 pounds <laughs> dripping <Maybe>. wet <laughs> and uh and I I I actually was at the game and in, in San Diego against Texas A&M where you got just obliterated for four quarters and you were you were beat up pretty hard then obviously the life in the NFL and getting traded and moving and everything that goes into it um Nowadays, a lot of these kids, I think, get a, a, a little bit of a bad rap. I, I think they're more resilient than we give them credit for. But uh, a lot of kids get pinned with this, you're not resilient, this millennial uh, generation. I kind of disagree with that a little bit. But Especially this last year. Yeah. I mean, gosh, if there's a generation that showed us that they could take difficulty and keep going – yeah, they've proven that yeah, during this pandemic, you know, they're they're stronger than we've given them credit for, for sure. But you do you, you you around your team and the kids that you saw and your own kids down in, in Arizona. What, what do you think about this resiliency principle kids nowadays and and us as parents? I think we sometimes hammer on kids for maybe not being resilient, but we're the ones teaching them. Right. We're we're the ones that have <laughs> yeah. changed the world for them. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that, that's something you see, like, you know, I don't know, when I was growing up, my dad, he, he had me kind of fight my own battles. And if it was having to go talk to a coach or talk to a teacher, you, you know, I had to go do it. And it seems like now, you know, and I'm probably guilty of this at times too, um, but I, I try not to be, I try to have, have our dog go and, and interact and talk and, and try to solve their, their problems with, with the coach or with the teacher and, and you need to go talk to them. And, and so I think it's good for parents to allow kids to have to learn to communicate and, and go ask questions. Why am I not playing? Why am I, 
you know, why am I sitting? Uh, what do I need to do to get better, to, to get more playing time and, and have the kid go do that instead of parents write an email or call a meeting with a coach. Uh, sometimes we, we enable that, you know, that non-resilient behavior of, for a kid where we're just going to handle all their problems and life's easy. You know, life's not easy. It's hard. And, uh, and so, you know, if we can teach our kids at a young age to handle some of that themselves, and then, you know, once they've tried that and there's still some issues, you know, yeah, it's okay for a parent then at that point to go in and let's all sit down together and get on the same page. So, um, you know, but as Shad said, kids are resilient. They'll, they'll do whatever, you know, you kind of, you know, ask them to do. Um, and so as parents, we need to ask them to do a little more. We need as coaches to ask them to do more and, and uh, have the expectations there because they'll meet whatever expectations are set. Sometimes those expectations, we, we sell them a, sh- a little short as coach parents. Yeah, I agree. I do too. You know, Ty, this is maybe going back to the beginning a little bit, but we have a lot of parents and coaches who listen to this podcast and a lot of parent coaches who listen to this podcast. Um, and I've always, I've always loved hearing you and, and your brother and, you know, others talk. I mean, the great relationship that you had with your, with your father. And that doesn't always happen when a, when a father coaches a son or, or a daughter or a mother coaches their, their son or daughter. And I was just wondering what, what your father did as you reflect, I read many of the tributes that, that were given to him and uh, how did he maintain that relationship to coach you? Obviously he must've coached you hard to, to help you become and, and your brother become what you did. But, but also to maintain that fatherly relationship with you. I would just love any insights you've learned about that balance. Yeah, there, you know, I mean, I, I see it from time to time. And, I, you know, I've seen it within my own family coaching, you know, uh, my daughter's team, you know, at an early age. And, and uh, or my brother coaching his boys or brother-in-laws coaching their kids. Um, you see it because you the best for your kids you know for me it was always as long as they're going hard I don't care as long as they're hustling and they're they're putting the time in and the work in they're going to make mistakes so I can live with that you know um and so I think that was the way it was for my dad as long as we were given effort and uh we were going to make some mistakes but we give effort and those were the expectations and and then he taught the game he didn't sit there and do it because I said to do it, you know, um, here's why we're doing it, those kind of things. So I think sometimes we get caught up um, as coaches and parents, and, and I know I'm guilty of it at times too, like just do it this way and then you don't tell them why. And, and, and then they're in their head like, well, that doesn't make sense. But if you explain it to them, then they, they kind of get it. And so for me, my dad was just, he was that even keel. He didn't get too high. He didn't get too low on a bad game or a good game. It was that even keel. And, and you know, Dustin and I have talked that with quarterbacks that you've got to be a flatliner. You you can't have the high roller coaster of emotions up and down in a game. You've got to just stay steady. And my dad was that type of coach. You know, he just stayed steady and – you know, I, I think he yelled at me one time, you know, there was never personal attacks or you're an idiot. What are you doing? None of those kind of things. It was okay. Hey, let's talk about this. You know, what did you see? Ask questions, what I saw, and then let's communicate on what he saw and what he thought maybe should have happened. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think conditions a big part of it for coaches is, pull the kid aside and, you know, most kids aren't out there dinking around and, and just messing up on purpose. So I think sometimes we need to just pull them aside and ask them, what did you see? What made you do what you did? And, and then, you know, find out what's how their brain's working and how we can help them understand, maybe see it a different way. Um, so I was fortunate that way with my dad and, and, uh, but I, I do see parents and, 
and probably have been that dad where I'm yelling at my daughter to, Hey, let's go. You know, I just want to see effort, you know? And so, um, I know what they're capable of and, and a lot of dads are too, but you know, when it becomes personal attack or, you know, calling kids names and those kind of things, they're not, that doesn't help anyone. It doesn't make kids play better. Matter of fact, like last year at a soccer, well, two years ago at a soccer game, perfect example, the, the refs kind of missed a call. They, they blew a call. Our parents in the stands start just yelling. And, and the girls were out and around kind of, you know, smiling. Girls, girls play a little different than guys anyway. They have a good time. <laughs> they kind of enjoy the game a little. They're not the intense, you know, I got to go kill somebody. I got to win right now. They, they play the game and, and they got to play loose. And when the parents started yelling at the officials, then another call didn't go our way. And now they really started yelling and the girls tightened up. And next thing you know, we lost the game because when we were a better team, but I think I could see the change in the girls demeanor. Uh, they, they tightened up and they got tense and they got mad. And, and instead of just letting it roll off their shoulders and go make another play, they, they let that affect them. And, and it was caused parents yelling <laughs> during the game behind them, uh, that that really tightened up the whole attitude for them. That's interesting. Just real quick. I, so we just interviewed Doug Meacham, who's a longtime high school coach, played for Rick Majerus. The two things he said that impressed him about Rick Majerus was he always demanded effort and he taught the game. Yeah. He taught them why they do what they do and, and why everyone on the team, what their role was. He taught them their role and demanded effort in their role. It yeah. just seems like mm-hmm. that seems to be this great uh, among great coaches. They demand great effort and they actually teach the game. Uh, I, I think that's remarkable. So Ty, when you, you told a story um, and I thought of it when you were talking about, uh, the differences between the athletes and, and, and how sometimes the, the the being a little bit too hard on a kid can mag- actually cause the kid to retract rather than to, to try harder. Um, the kids are built different. We as adults are built differently. And obviously we need to know which buttons the, the one button might work with player a at the same button on player B, he would shut down. You played with uh, Brett Favre, and Steve Young. And at a, we had a dinner event a couple of years ago where you told some interesting stories about sort of the differences between those two and how they prepared both of them, you know, Hall of Fame uh, quarterbacks. Share a little bit of that with us, being in that locker room with those two and, and kind of how they approach the game so differently. Yeah, uh, two totally different personalities in the locker room, uh, preparing for games and things. Brett was just that kind of loosey goosey, uh, having a good time, joking, telling jokes. Steve was the total opposite. He's throwing up before the game. He's nervous about this play or that play or this player. Um, he just was super hyper focused on all the little things that needed to go right and worried about them where Favre just was like, eh, we'll go make a play, whatever, see a guy and throw it, you know? Um, <laughs> And so, you know, I think they had to be coached different ways where Steve kind of needed to be like very disciplined and here's how we're going to do it and, and have all the, the tools to, to be successful. Where Brett, you know, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't yell at him and confine him in his little box. You had to kind of let him go and, and accept some of the mistakes with, with what came with him winning some games for you by being that gunslinger, you know, he was going to throw a pick or two early in the game. And then he might just throw a rocket in there that nobody else in the league could throw and, and, uh, win the game for you. So, um, Holmgren would, would yell at the backups and not really yell at Brett all that much. And probably with Steve early on, you know, Mike Holmgren coached him in San Francisco and probably was more detailed and hey, all right, this is exactly how we're going to do it, and uh, and Steve would take that to heart. So, um, just two different personalities had to probably be coached differently and and have different expectations from a coach. So you know, we always talk that yeah, as a coach, you come in saying, okay, we're not treating anybody any different than the other guy, and 
then you get there and you realize that some kids need to be talked to and, and pulled aside and, and work through some things. Other kids, you can kind of yell, Hey, let's go get lined up, you know, and, and they kind of need that to, to wake them up a little bit. So every kid's different. Everyone's going to react differently to the situation and, and how they're coached. And so, um, you know, as a coach, you got to kind of find what works for each kid and, and coach them accordingly. I think it's the same for our, probably for our kids, right? I mean, I know my kids, I not, not too far apart in age and, and the same family, but they're completely different in how we have to parent them. And so we had that with our daughters one time where they were young, they were probably eight and six and our two oldest and we came home and they gave the babysitter a hard time. And, and so uh, we had made some cookies that next day and we said, okay, you can get a spanking and still have cookies or you cannot take the cookies and not get a spanking. And my oldest was like, I'm not getting a spanking. Like that was the worst thing you could do to her. My second oldest was like, I'll take the spanking thinking because I want the cookies. And so <laughs> that shows you, I mean, they're two totally different. Like it didn't matter what, uh, <laughs> what you did for her. It was, she wanted that reward, you know? And, and so, and my oldest, she was like thing, but a spanking, you know, I'll cookies, I'll not go to someone's house. And so, you know, you parent her differently. It's like, okay, your punishment is, you know, here's, you know, it's the threat of a spanking didn't get many, but, um, and then my next one is like, no rounded, you can't go and have the, <laughs> that would her not want to misbehave next time. So it's interesting for sure. Yeah. You know, one of the, you know, our principles a lot. Um, but one of them is compete without contempt. And, um, recently the, the BYU Utah rivalry, you know, in the last decade has become even so intense. People have worried about it, you know. Um, but you always seem to, <laughs> what's that? Canceled games, even. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just wondering. You played in a in a rivalry, and you know, some people around the country may not realize how how contested of a rivalry that is, and and how contentious that could become. But. Um, but what would you say to people, even about that rivalry, to help us remember that principle of competing without contempt, without hatred in our heart? I'm just wondering how you approach that, those situations when you when you played against a rival. So I think I think people need to realize for the players, it's not as big a deal as it is for the fans. You know, the, the fans kind of make it what it is, um, whether it's that bitter hatred between each other. Um, but the players, you know, a lot of times you're, you're around them a little bit. You get to know them as people. Sometimes you're at different functions or whatever it may be. And you kind of get to know a guy or, or you knew him in high school and your friends on social media or whatever it may be. So for the players, it's not, as as big a deal it's still a big deal don't get me wrong you know that rivalry is, is always going to be bragging rights in the state but for the for the fans they kind of make it contentious more than it needs to be and so i think uh i think people need to realize like i mean it's good for the state for every team in utah to be good and to, to win their conference and yeah when you're playing that week you want to win more than the other guy but then when it's over, it's okay to root for those guys and, and hope they have a good season because it's only going to make you look better uh, in the long run. And and so as fans, I, I think I see some of that at times. I see fans getting along on social media, and then you always have the knuckleheads that <laughs> want to stir the pot and make it bigger than it is. Um, so for players and coaches, it, it's another game, and, and there is a little more meaning to it than, than another game on the schedule. But – at the end of the day, it doesn't make or break your season as a player, uh, as a fan. Sometimes it does. And that's, that's wrong. You know, I mean, it's, it should be, uh, wanting a great game, wanting, wanting to win, but then after it's over, you're rooting for that group because they're right up the road from us. And, and it's just going to make everybody look better in the whole state. Awesome. There might be some parenting advice in that comment to, uh, Ty and, and Chad that, 
I think sometimes as parents, uh, I know some of the kids I coach, sometimes I've seen this and I'm sure I'm guilty for it as well. We want it more than the kid does. And, uh, <laughs> And, you know, sometimes I think it'd probably be wise for us to remember that the kid wants to go play the game that they love and that they enjoy playing with their friends. And, and uh, maybe we would be wise to back off a little bit and not make it so life or death, whether or not they went four for four or made the basket or not, and let them enjoy it. Because we, we probably make it a little more contentious than it needs to be as well when the kid just wants to go. <laughs> go play. So there's probably some parenting advice in that as well, Ty. Oh yeah, for sure. I think, you know, that, and as coaches, you know, we put so much time into game planning and watching film. And then you, you realize sometimes that your players are hardly putting any time in just whatever they're practicing is the only time they think about it. And then as a coach, you're like, man, why am I spending all this time in <laughs> this game plan together if they're not even going to care really that much about it but you do it because that's what you do you know and you do it again the next week even though maybe nobody's watching film that week but um you're right the kids just want to play they want to go have a great experience have fun and and uh it's not life or death that might be a good one to finish on shad that it's 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 a game, right? It's, it's, we love it. It's sports. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be a release for us. It's not supposed to be something that makes our lives more stressful or, or more painful. And yes, there's painful lessons and that's where we learn resiliency and other life lessons that help us after sports. But at the end of the day, whether you're an athlete listening to this or a parent of an athlete or a coach that it really is just a game that we all love and, and the sun will come up the next day. And in most cases, we'll a week or two might pass, but then we'll realize life goes on and there's other joys in life, whether or not we, we made the shot or not. Um, and as, as parents, let's try to focus more on that. Let it, let it be what it's meant to be at its, at its core sports is it's the love of the game and it's the fun and the camaraderie and the competing with each other. And, and that's the beauty of it. And, I think if we have our eyes up and we're aware of that, and we do a little bit more work to teach that to our kids uh, and, and to the teams we coach and things that we'll all be better off for it. For sure. That was well said. Well, Ty, we appreciate you hopping on with us, man. It's, it's always good to have you and hopefully we can get you on again. We'd love to chat with you about other things as topics come up and we know you're a close friend of the program. So we hope that's okay if we invite you on another time. Yeah, you bet. Love to. So appreciate you having me on today. Okay. Well, thanks, man. Eyes up, do the work, everybody. Thank you. Hope you'll keep following us and, and share the podcast. Share it with your friends. If you're interested in the book, The Sport Light, you can get it at especiallyforathletes.org and follow us on social media at E4A Family. Also uh, on Facebook and Instagram. And look forward to continuing to more episodes coming and previous episodes if you haven't listened to them. Please go listen to them. We've had some great interviews and a lot more coming up. So eyes up, do the work. This has been the Sportlight Podcast from Especially for Athletes, sponsored by Coca-Cola. You can learn more about Especially for Athletes by visiting the website at especiallyforathletes.org. You can also learn more about the book, The Sportlight, by Shad Martin and Dustin Smith at especiallyforathletes.org slash book.